You're listening to the Seasteading Today podcast, where we speak to entrepreneurs and researchers who are making the dream of seasteading a reality. The Seasteading Today podcast. Stop arguing and start seasteading. Hello, seasteaders. This is Carly Jackson on the Seasteading Today podcast. My guest today is Dr. Ricardo Radulovich, a professor at the University of Costa Rica, where he works on promoting aquatic food production. We talked about how cultivating seaweed can reverse some of the damage done to waterways caused by land-based agriculture. Here at the Seasteading Institute, we often get contacted by people who are worried that building seasteads will just expand the problems created on land into the ocean. Projects like Dr. Radulovich's seaweed farms show us how to grow food and create jobs while improving the health of the ocean. In this podcast, you'll learn that seaweed is a lot more than that slimy stuff that brushes against your leg at the beach. Enjoy the interview with Dr. Ricardo Radulovich. Hello, and welcome to the Seasteading Today podcast. My guest today is Dr. Ricardo Radulovich, who is working to feed the world by cultivating seaweed. Welcome, Dr. Radulovich. Hello. Thank you for having me. So the Seasteading book talks about your Sea Gardens project and the Cultivated Seaweeds for Food project. Are those projects still active? In a way, yes. We're, we're doing that. We are cultivating seaweeds and we're advancing in their use as food. And there are many other uses as well. Yes, we continue doing that. And uh, we are now beginning another project aiming at... Um, solving some limitations, for example, reproduction laboratories and stuff like that, to be able to do it at a larger scale. That's wonderful. So tell us a bit about uh, what are some of the problems that can be solved by cultivating seaweed? Well, the the basic idea is that um, agriculture on land may not be sufficient to provide all the needed increases in food particularly not only because of uh, increasing population and demand for this increasing population, but also due to, say, climate change and uh, also on itself. Even without climate change, we were having a lot of problems with water limitations. So, of course, agriculture may provide sufficient food, but uh, at what cost? So we need alternative sources of food, and I think that if the main limitation to food production on land is the water and lack of good land for agriculture, then we have all the water we need and all the area we need to cultivate at sea. So that's the basic principle. We believe that a lot of biomass, plant biomass that can be produced for food, feed, and other uses can be produced at sea. So as, as a landlocked person who has, you know, minimal information about uh, what causes climate change, how, how does moving farming to sea, how do we not just transfer the same problems that we've created with land agriculture? Why, why don't those same problems transfer when we're cultivating seaweed? There, that may happen. Uh, we may eventually end up having some problems similar in many ways or different than in agriculture. Uh, But so far, we have identified mostly benefits from growing seaweeds. There are some limitations. Of of course, there are some diseases. There are uh, problems also with water being uh, heating up, ocean heating that affects some of the established practices around the world. So we have to be aware of those limitations as well. But the the beauty of cultivating seaweeds is that uh, we don't need fertilizer because at least up to a very high point, we can produce using the excess nutrients that are present in water. These excess nutrients come from land, from agricultural runoff, from sewage, waters. So we're having, for example, all these uh, algal blooms, even the sargasso problem in the Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean, is uh, in, in very much related to excess nutrients in the waters. So we take advantage of that. 
And, and at the same time, then we clean the water, uh, all those excess nutrients. So it is so the, like a win-win situation. Okay, so that so it sounds like you know land agriculture, a lot of the fertilizer and runoff from those land uh, from land agriculture washes into the rivers and washes into the sea, and so cultivating seaweed at, on the coast can take advantage of of taking those that runoff and turning uh, it, it into a useful product, which is algae and seaweed. Is that correct? Correct. Also, at the same time, contributing to clean the water. Okay. So uh, why? So I, I've read about red algae on the coast of Florida. So that's a bad kind of algae, or is it just that people are not in a position to take to use that algae? No, we we have no clue really how to use these uh, microalgae blooms that like those ha happening in Florida. Those are usually associated with some toxic elements that these microalgae produce. So they can have uh, harmful uh, harmful effects beyond uh, a lot of biomass in the water, you see, because you can have alg algal blooms that are not toxic, but the water gets so polluted with organic matter that then all the oxygen is used up by bacteria consuming the dead bodies of algae, and they uh, all the waters then become... Um, hypoxic, low in oxygen, even uh, dead in many ways they are called. Mm -hmm. So that's one problem. But then sometimes microalgae are also associated with some toxins they produce. So it is a, a compounded problem. We would be solving those problems in many ways because these blooms are associated with excess nutrients. Mm -hmm. So we need to manage those nutrients. And even... Only for that purpose, we could uh, cultivate seaweeds just to clean up these excess nutrients. So tell us about your seaweed farms that you are, are building. What, uh, what do they look like and where are they located? And who is, who is working these uh, seaweed farms? Well, we are working with uh, fishers, men and women. Um, they are the ones who we, we want to be farmers. Fishers in all around the world are uh, suffering from dwindling fisheries. Uh, they are in need of additional sources of income. And to cultivate seaweed seems like a, a very viable option in many ways and also helps to preserve their way of life. They continue working at sea. It's just that they change from being only fishers to being fishers and farmers as well. We also work integrating seaweed with other forms of aquaculture, like fish farming or a bivalve, like mussels and oysters, because this increases the opportunity to produce, uh, you know, profit, and uh, the interest of fishers is larger. It's, it's maintained by having different products to sell that have good market entry. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it provides a, a diverse uh, e economy for these fish, formerly, so these fishing communities have more uh, diverse economy and that can make their, their economy stronger. Is that, are you seeing that? Yes, yes. To have uh, this diversity is always a good way of uh, being sure that you will have something or a lot depending on conditions. For example, you may have a low fishing season, but you have your seaweeds, you have your bivalves, your mussels, for example, that keep on growing, and you always have something to sell or eat, even in some cases. It, this approach is uh, something that is uh, uh, analogous to some farming in, in agriculture. You find uh, many small farmers traditional farmers that they have all sort of different crops, trees, and uh, animals as well. Now, are these, um, so if, you're, if you have a seaweed farm and you're also growing mussels and supporting some, some fishing or fish farms, is that something that needs to be on the coast or could you move that out into the high seas for a seasteading community? Yes, in many ways you can. The point is that usually these excess nutrients are in uh, coastal waters. 
So you will have to locate areas and in the high seas where you have at least some input of nutrients. This can be also part of a scheme of uh, sustainable fertilization practices that you can uh, implement uh, at the high seas. So yes, you can you can do this. It doesn't matter. The production systems we have are floating. It doesn't matter how deep the bottom is. So what do the what do how does one start a seaweed farm? What does it look like? What what infrastructure do you need to start? Okay, usually what you need is just uh, moorings, attachment points where you have to be you have to be anchored to some place. You may have some free floating systems as well, but you have to be careful where you place them so you don't lose them, for example. And uh, if you have like, say, a seasteading, you may attach your seaweed cultivated areas to the more rigid, the bigger structures of the seasteading. So you may not need specific moorings uh, in the, on the bottom. Then you need ropes. Usually this is made with a different uh, arrangement of ropes with some uh, rigid, say, tubing or, or sticks or different uh, frames that you may use to keep form. You need to keep the ropes, say, different lines. This is called actually long line system, where you have lines of ropes, say, separated one meter from each other. Uh, you attach the seaweed propagule, the seaweed seed, to the rope. This seed can be a vegetative cutting from another seaweed plant, or it can be spores that you have into, uh, attached to the rope, and they start growing. You have the, then, then you have these ropes, rope lines, uh, where seaweeds are growing from them, uh, sucking up uh, nutrients from the water, and uh, using sunlight for photosynthesis. And then how do you, uh, uh, you said there's shellfish that can be introduced. How does that uh, work with the seaweed? Okay, uh, you have uh, different ways to produce shellfish, but then uh, one of them is, uh, say they're called socks or even lanterns. They are hanging structures, very simple structures like like you make you put a, 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 a say a sock is like a net that you fill up with muscles of certain size you hang them in the water hanging say from the same seaweed rope and they stay there uh, filtrating seawater and getting their nutrients their food actually their feed out of the water by this filtering system they have. So, and this increases uh, biodiversity in the water? Definitely. We even have a paper where we measured this. Uh, we all know, all of, the, all of us who work with aquaculture at sea know that anything you put floating on the sea attracts uh, fish and different forms of biodiversity. It can be crustaceans, mollusks, you know. Uh, for some reason, they, they come. Uh, this has not even been clearly explained. For example, there is a lot you can find in the literature about fish aggregating devices. So you just throw something floating on the water and you get fish around it. So when you have uh, seaweed farms, you also have feed for some of these animals as well. So you get uh, a, a complex, a complex trophic chain of animals coming to your farm that may sometimes become a plague. You know, <laughs> I mean, it may not be the best thing that a lot of herbivore fish are coming to feed on your seaweed, mm -hmm. for example. So, so it, it can become a problem, but it happens. You attract biodiversity. You maintain biodiversity. And at the same time, you enhance fisheries. So once you have these floating structures on water, uh, fish come and uh, it, fishing is improved. So those herbivore fish that are coming to feed on your seaweed, you may make uh, some, place some traps 
and get them for you to eat them. So, okay, when you're harvesting the seaweed, again, those of us who live on land, what if we don't want to eat seaweed? Do we, is seaweed in our products already that we use? Oh, a lot. Uh, one of the main uses of seaweeds is uh, for the hydrocolloid industry. These hydrocolloids or phycocolloids are some uh, thick, long-chain carbo- long carbohydrates. These seaweeds have, presumably to protect themselves from the marine environment. That is why some seaweeds, you touch them, are, they are like plastic kind of filling. Uh, these hydrocolloids like carrageenan or alginate or agar, they are extracted from seaweeds and they're used in many products that we use every day, like uh, toothpaste, like uh, different forms of meats, uh, hams, we put these carrageenans there. So we don't even realize how many products we consume that contain seaweed products. So that, that is a major industry in the world, like, uh, for example, maybe even more than 10 million tons of seaweeds are being produced just for the hydrocolloid industry. And what does that do for the product? I, I think I read that there's seaweed in ice cream, and I couldn't imagine what seaweed is adding to ice cream. Is it a texturizer? Is it a preservative? What's it doing? Like a gel that gives it consistency. Mm-hmm. Thickening is a thickening agent. Say you go some places and get a milkshake and you say, oh, how thick this is. Well, it is not only the ice cream, it's the seaweed product there, giving it consistency. So it's used like to, to give body to many products, like toothpaste, for example. It keeps form in many ways because of this seaweed uh, hydrocolloid in there. And uh, yeah. does, how does seaweed compare to, like, nutritionally? Is it better for us than, I think, than meat or, or I think that something similar that would add that same texture would be f- made from the hooves of animals. So does seaweed, is it healthier for us than, than those other uh, products? Well, it, they are another product to eat. Uh, I have eaten many seaweeds, I've read many papers, I've talked with many colleagues, and uh, they can be used already in different combinations, formulations, recipes. They are good in providing protein, fiber. Some They are low in fat, but they have very specialized uh, fatty acids, omega-3, 6, they are very high and good in some nu- micronutrients like iron, zinc, iodine, some vitamins. Even there is a debate as to how much seaweeds really contribute B12, the vitamin that is lacking in vegan diets because it is usually only from animal sources. So there is a debate on whether the B12 precursor found in seaweeds is adequate enough as B12 that people need. So they are very useful. They are not very high in calories. That can be changed. You see, we are working at the at the stage in, in which uh, many seaweeds we are using, cultivating, are one or two steps away from their natural origin. We have not advanced that much in breeding and selecting. Uh, so there can be a lot of work done in improving them. Just, it, just by, say, selection, breeding, to traditional breeding. We don't even have to resort to some gen- other genetic engineering tools. Uh, so there can be a lot of improvement improvements, like increasing their edibility in terms of this high amount of fiber they have, because in largely this is due to these hydrocolloids that are not very digestible. So we could, for example, decrease that 
concentration of hydrocolloids and have more digestible carbohydrates. So this kind of work will take us to having different kind of seaweeds that we already know, for example, but they are more nutritious, more palatable. Uh, I joke like saying that uh, eventually we will have seaweeds tasting like bananas. <laughs> yeah, you see, we can we can do a lot of things and it's being done like in China, Japan, they have these very specialized seaweed varieties that they have been developing for centuries. So they have, they're very choosy uh, they, they, in, in what seaweed they want, how they want it. So it's already very much adapted to what they want. The, the seaweed provides what they want. We need to advance more into that. Okay, so the sea, the seasteading book was published about two years ago. So what progress have you seen and, and how, is, how have your projects grown in those past two years? Well, there has been an increased awareness of the relevance of seaweeds as food, of seaweed cultivation. But this is uh, also due to the fact that we have gone deeper into climate change problems. Water is more limiting, droughts are affecting here and there. So we are realizing uh, more that uh, we need solutions, alternative solutions. So that also has helped and there are now many countries that are at least at the pilot stage or demonstration stage, cultivating seaweeds, beginning to cultivate seaweeds. And we have joined efforts with other colleagues from around the world. And uh, we are very clear on about where this is happening, how we should help them advance, how we should or could help other countries realize the relevance of this and begin doing their own pilot experiments and, and, and trying to use it, that as food. So there has been a, an, an increase in the, in the awareness and in the global movement towards cultivating seaweeds for different products and ecosystem services. And also in eating seaweeds, they are more available everywhere now. And what, when you go to a new country, what are some of the obstacles for people to be able to start building these farms? Are there regulatory barriers or is, are there cultural barriers where people need, need to understand why it will be helpful for them? What are some of the challenges that you have to overcome? Well, if this were like an exam question, I would say all of the above mm -hmm. that you just mentioned. Yes, regulatory uh, laws on aquaculture have not been like uh, drafted or enacted uh, with this in mind because it's so new. Many countries have not considered it, but there are usually, say, ways of doing this uh, at least initially, experimentally, in in a pilot manner. But that has not stopped, for example, seaweeds from gro from growing in many places so, so far. So how do you how do you go about that? If someone does does someone in another country contact you and say I want to grow one of your farms, and then you you go to them and work through the local restrictions, or how how do you approach that and and look for places where to expand your seaweed farming? Yes, uh, we have contacts uh, usually university people that are, are into this and they are usually associated with some NGOs and also with some private companies. For example, in India. Right now there is a, a growing interest in India to advance in seaweed cultivation and use as food and for other purposes. And there are already several, say, small to medium-sized companies producing seaweeds for the hydrocolloid market. So even though there is no clear regulatory frame for this, it is allowed. And uh, of course, if, 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 if we or they want to go like in a much larger effort, I'm sure there would have to be some uh, adjustments to limitations in regulatory processes and permits, concessions. But so far, 
they are doing it and, and, and in a legal in a legal manner and uh, this has happened everywhere I mean uh, the the laws are usually flexible enough to allow it even though they have not been enacted with this in, in mind so I think this can grow uh, fast enough uh, uh, in, unimpeded enough so that at the same time there are changes happening that allow it to continue grow expansion. So if I w- wanted to build a seastead out in, in, in the high seas, not in any country's territorial area, um, then at least that would remove the barrier of, of these regulations. But what would be the challenge for me to, to build a seaweed farm um, out out in the high seas. Why couldn't? Why aren't people doing that right now? Well, you see, this is um, like a, a stage in where uh, we are not completely experienced in doing this. The markets are not there. Uh, for ex- let me give you an example. This hydrocolloid industry was operating in Canada and in other places, and they moved to tropical conditions. And uh, they found that very large farms were inefficient because of nutrient and other limitations. So they went into promoting uh, multiple small farms managed by fishers. And in Indonesia, uh, seaweed farming went from almost nothing to about um, seven, eight million tons per year in about a 10, 12 year period. So, but this is composed mostly of small farms because they take advantage of cheap labor, labor, uh, low cost, uh, startup costs. Like for example, imagine that you, for any operation you have at in the high seas or just a few miles away from the coast, you need uh, a lot of additional infrastructure, like for taking care of what you have, because you may have everything stolen from you, all the ropes, the buoys. You need boats to go back and forth, uh, harvesting machines, and you see it becomes something that requires a bigger investment and markets are not there yet. So we have, we have been confronted with a dilemma that I, I place it like this. There are no seaweeds in markets because there is no production and there is no production because there is no market. Mm. <laughs> so how we, do we break this uh, like vicious cycle? We work both ways, say increasing supply, but also trying to increase demand. So how can yeah. how can seasteaders who I hope are listening to this podcast how can they find your seaweed and buy it and increase demand? Yes, uh, well, there are, for example, in the United States, several companies that are already producing seaweed. They sell it uh, raw, they sell it dry, they sell it in beer, they sell it in cookies. <laughs> in beer, they sell it in beer. Yes, some people are making seaweed beer. Uh, so, you know, what do you call, some people are like, like call uh, seaweed soap, but it may have like, like a very small percentage of seaweed. We mm. need to be more clear about that because not anything that has like, say, 0.5% seaweed it becomes a tor- seaweed tortilla chip. <laughs> so, yeah, but we have made those. And so they're coming, they're coming to the market and then in Europe, at least in many supermarkets, you find sections with different seaweed products already being sold and you can choose it among them. In the United States, also you're having some places where you can buy them and, uh, and say Amazon or stuff like that. You, you, may, you may start looking around and you will find more seaweed. It would be great if people would start trying them. People are surprised uh, how interesting it uh, flavor, texture, they add to your regular meal. For example, we make a bread that has, uh, we substitute uh, wheat flour with, uh, we, we 
add 5% seaweed flour, so a 95% wheat flour. And so we get a bread that is like greenish with little specks of seaweed. It gives it like a very interesting flavor. And it is uh, nutritionally better because you have a different complement of amino acids, more iron, more zinc, and the proteins are okay. So it, it, and it's, you add more fiber. So you can start playing with your in your kitchen also, not only trying things that are already made with seaweed or have a little seaweed. You can also, for example, have a salt sh shakers with... Uh, uh, ground uh, seaweed or in little pieces, uh, you add it here and there. You are preparing a dish instead of adding only, say, ground black pepper or chili pepper. You may also add a little seaweed here and there. You're making a, a juice, a fruit juice. You add a little of seaweed and it gets blended together with the fruit. And so you improve your nutrition in many ways. Mm -hmm. For example, one of the major advances that we were able to appreciate in a recent symposium in Korea, the International Seaweed Symposium was conducted, say, like a month and a half ago in Korea, was that uh, they are finding very interesting links with uh, gut microflora, uh, with your microbes, your internal microbes mm -hmm. and, and seaweeds. For example, they are uh, exploring this relationship in Japanese communities that, that have for a long time eaten seaweed and their lower propensity to cancer and longer longevity. And, uh, and, and they, are they are associated to eating the seaweeds because they provide, say, this fiber and these bioactive compounds that are turning out to be like very good for you. There are some that are not that great also. It's not like you eat, you eat any seaweed and any everything. No, there is work behind that. There is selection. There is, you know, a, a very serious set of standards that are being formalized, um, biosecurity issues, inequity. All these things are related also to seaweed consumption and processing. So it is, it is becoming like uh, uh, yet another set of, food that can be used regularly and found everywhere for your use as food. It sounds like the seaweed market is, is there's a lot of opportunity with a lot of the other trends in nutrition and, and climate concerns. So it seems like things, it, it, you, you would have an optimistic view of, of building more and more seaweed farms and having that market grow. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, as I said, we, we need to work with supply and demand. You know, we cannot say entice many farmers, many fishers. Uh, hey, guys, let's go and, and, and plant seaweed, cultivate seaweed, and then you, you harvest it and you dry it, you sun dry it, or you have this little drying facility, and then you put it in sacks and, and nobody's going to buy it. <laughs> You know, so so it is a, a situation that it's very well. You have to be very careful in, in how you, how and when you entice people to grow seaweeds. That uh, you have to assure that there will be somebody buying them uh, these seaweeds at a decent price, uh, and then these people who buy the seaweed also have to have a market for their products. That's why the hydrocolloid uh, industry has promoted seaweed farming with so much success in many countries, like Indonesia, Philippines, and now in India, Sri Lanka, other places they are producing seaweed. Even Chile produces a lot of uh, seaweed for the hydrocolloid market. And uh, because that's a, a secure market, mm -hmm. it has had a lo lots of ups and downs. And then there are some seaweeds preferred over other seaweed species. But then uh, it, that's like in agriculture as well. So, so that's why the hydrocolloid industry has been key in promoting seaweed cultivation and, and use, but it's sort of limited. We want to have more, but then for that, we need a market. Sure, and to have sure. a market, we need products. <laughs> sure. So what progress do you have to see in the seasteading movement in the next few years? And 
you know, how can that align with the growth in seaweed in the seaweed market? Yeah. Okay. I think uh, that there's there are two things we're talking about here. If you have a seasteading, you may want to have uh, some levels of food security that you are not strictly required or, or, or depend on the boat to come with the food, for example. Uh, it may be okay. You may you may do that. You may depend uh, rely completely on food from land. But if you are able to produce your own say like have gardens or begin uh, exploring further and add uh, shellfish and uh, fish cages with fish being fed some of the seaweed you produce uh, that that gives you uh, well something to do uh, also gives you some additional food maybe some additional income then you may start growing that if it, if it goes okay you may find that uh, the area where you have your seastead is adequate for this or that production. And so you may emphasize that and, and have a bigger production that may come to feed markets in the nearby countries. So it, it is uh, like a virtuous cycle that you begin testing and adding your own seaweed and the fish and the shellfish, shrimp, lobster, you you use some uh, residues from your kitchen, from your maybe your waste waters. You may use that uh, after the processing for fertilizing waters to grow more seaweeds. Uh, so it, it can be done. And, and, and once you have a added levels of security, food security, I think it, it gives you uh, a more um, reliable way to, to be out there not having to fully completely depend on food that comes from land. Sure. Well, I think that's definitely the goal. And it, of course, reduces the cost of living out there because we want people to be able to live out there who at all levels of income. And, and, you know, in the book, Joe Quirk talks a lot about how your seaweed farms enrich the poor and provide, and we talked a little bit about how it provides a diverse economy for fishing communities. So, you know, I, I think that that having people uh, provide for themselves is is a way to have a, a flourishing community. That's I think that's maybe the definition of a flourishing community. And um, I think it's great to have you on our on our relaunch of the podcast um, to help seasteaders understand how to get to those free communities on the sea that will be food secure and restore the environment and provide uh, good work for, for people at all income levels. Um, so as we wrap up our conversation, is there anything else you would like to talk about specifically? Anything else you would like to promote? Well, I would say go ahead and try them. Uh, <laughs> You know, it is uh, even even if you are at the coast, or you you see some seaweeds. Usually, you can have some identification. You know, you can see what they are, and uh, you may try those. I mean, you can see, you can talk to locals and and uh, harvest a little, try seaweeds, uh, buy them in your supermarket or online, and begin playing with that. And you will see that the, you know it helps in many ways. For example, the fiber has many good properties. It, it, it is much better than other land uh, sources of fiber. So uh, experiment and uh, that will help the industry, it will help the movement and it will help getting into the sea, colonizing the sea and at the same time taking care of it. So it's a, it's a good thing. Wonderful. And how can people find you? Do you have a website? Do you have social media where people can find you and support you? You know, I... I make that, that mistake because I don't even have a uh, business card. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, well, you can find some publications and, and research gate. You just, you just have to write my name and, and in Google and it comes up. So you can find me that my email is usually somewhere in there. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, you, you can find me just by doing that. Just by Google, Google Googling me up. Sorry. My English is. <laughs> And can um, can people purchase 
I think the sea saving book says that you need you needed five people and some minimal investment in in this the ropes and the other pieces for the seastead farm. Is that something that people can can find and purchase, or or do you have to go through a specific program to no, to get you those? Can, you you can do it on your own. There there are many ways. Just just start searching in in, in uh, images and and uh, papers. That describe how this farming is done. If you live by the live by the coast, you can you can have your little patch. But remember, there are some limitations that you have to take care of. For example, you cannot place these where people are boating or where people usually fish with nets. Sometimes they may steal your steal your stuff, you know, away or just damage it just to see what you have. So it is. It, it has some conditions that you have to be careful with. And uh, if you have a place that you, you can do this, uh, uh, go ahead and just put some ropes out and, and, and uh, follow some basic designs that you can see in the literature, in the media, and uh, start attaching some pieces of seaweed to your ropes and see how they grow. It is. It is not that complex. There are usually the universities, uh, local uh, state universities, public universities in the United States. They have uh, usually people that uh, are experts in this. Several have uh, some growing seaweed cultivation programs. Uh, so you can ask them for help. You can see their websites and get some local information for your own seaweed startup. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us. This has been Dr. Ricardo Radulovich on the Seasteading Today podcast. And thanks for being here. Thank you, Carly. Good luck with, with the Seasteading. Thank you. Bye. Bye. The Seasteading Today podcast is produced by John Bush. Your host is Carly Jackson. Send feedback and questions to podcast at seasteading.org. To support the podcast and the Seasteading mission, go to seasteading.org slash donate. If you'd like to learn more, read the book, Seasteading, How Floating Nations Will Restore the Environment, Enrich the Poor, Cure the Sick, and Liberate Humanity from Politicians. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast feed and we'll save you a spot on a seastead.